Hello chess friends! In this video we are going to be looking at a game which one could argue is the most important game of Magnus Carlsen's entire career. The year is 2013. Magnus Carlsen is coming towards the end of his first ever world championship match against Vichy Anand. Eight rounds of 12 have been played. The score is 5-3 to three in Magnus Carlsen's favor. There are four games left and out of those four games Anand needs to score three points to catch up to Carlsen either by winning two games and drawing two, or he could win three games and lose one. Or of course he could win all four games, but that's not likely. So Anand with the white pieces here, he really needs to win. So let's get right into this game and see how he tries to accomplish that. D4, Carlsen plays knight to f6, c4, e6, knight to c3, defending the e4 square, hoping to get a big pawn center with e4. Carlsen puts a stop to that with bishop to b4, pinning the knight, now the e4 square lacks defense. So Anand plays this sameish variation with f3, just stubbornly trying to get in e4, supported by the f3 pawn. It also keeps a knight off of e4. If black were to play c5, then d5 could be white's response here. And there's no knight e4. That would be a troublesome move for white if it were possible, hitting the pinned knight. So f3, though it looks kind of strange, does have some good logic to it. Carlsen plays d5. Probably the best move, just adding more attack to the e4 square, preventing e4. Anand plays a3, putting a question to Carlsen's bishop. Now rather than backing up with the bishop and allowing e4, Carlsen takes out one of the defenders of e4, the knight on c3. After b takes c3, white has one less piece defending e4, and black is going to try to prevent that move and make the case that f3 was a wasted move. Of course, we'll see later in the game that it's not totally a pointless move because it does support the move g4 later on. Carlsen here continues with c5, striking at the center. It's a good move. Anand takes on d5. That rids himself of the doubled pawns, takes one pawn off of the diagonal for this bishop, trades a less central pawn for black's more central pawn. If you were to take what superficially looks like a free pawn on c5, well, look at these horrible tripled up pawns can't defend each other. Knight b to d7 is looking just to pick up the pawn again, and then how are you gonna defend that c5 pawn? You wanna play bishop e3? Well, now you've blocked your e-pawn. Bishop's in an awkward spot. Not to mention the fact that black can just take this pawn on c4, so yeah, you don't wanna take on c5. Anand played the correct move. C takes d5, and Carlsen recaptures with the pawn, keeping control over the e4 square. And now Anand just goes ahead and plays e3. He needs to develop this bishop develop this knight and then castle. He doesn't have time to mess around trying to force e4. If you were to try to add protection to the e4 square, let's say you play something like queen to d3, black's just gonna continue with something like knight c6. Now d4 needs more protection because if you were to play e4, takes, takes, and then takes, there's too many pieces hitting d4. So you could try bishop b2, but then black can castle. And even here you can't play e4 because takes, takes, and what do you think black should play here? I'll give you two seconds. Knight takes e4. It's maybe the simplest. You can't recapture that knight if you want to keep your queen. Because look, rook e8. Uh-oh. So it's most prudent for Anand to simply play what he played in the game. e3, getting ready to develop the bishop. Now Carlson here decides to lock down the pawn structure with c4. Interesting decision. It looks kind of good because the bishop can't go to d3. That would be the best post for the bishop. Now it's got to go to e2. Not so active there. This bishop isn't so active either. But the computer doesn't really like this move all that much. You'll notice it does put two pawns on the same color complex as Carlson's remaining bishop. That's not ideal. According to the engine, better here would be to just castle, allow bishop d3, and then just play rook e8 and... Just develop normally, maybe b6. After c4, Anand plays knight to e2 here. It was not the best move according to the engine, which likes this move g4. Apparently, white can already get a kingside attack going with the pawns. Another nice point to this move, which is pretty significant, is this, this bishop can't go to f5. That's really its only active diagonal right now. If black were to try to challenge this pawn, by playing h5, then we just push to g5, and this knight has to go backwards. That's not ideal for black. But after what was played in the game, this knight e2, Carlsen could have played h5 here. 
preventing g4, which would allow his bishop to get to f5. So that would have been the best play right there. But Carlsen instead just plays knight to c6. And now Anand does play g4. Carlsen simply castles, and Anand develops his bishop to g2. Note that here g5 is not good here because the knight can go to h5. On the previous variation we looked at with the pawn on h5, that was not possible and the knight had to go backwards. So that's why g5 is not quite accurate here. Bishop g2 played. Now Carlsen goes knight to a5, looking to infiltrate white's camp with knight to b3, which would be a fork of the bishop and rook. It's an aggressive post for the knight, but it is kind of on the edge of the board. It's not any huge worry for white. If this knight could instead post up somewhere over here, near the white king, it would be a whole different story. Anand castles allows knight to b3, rook's under attack. He's not so worried about the knight taking out his bad bishop. You know, this is the bishop blocked by all the pawns. But he doesn't want to lose the rook, so he goes rook to a2. Interesting decision. Some players might think that putting the rook to b1 is better. But I think the logic here is that he's anticipating that Carlsen is going to go ahead with a queenside expansion. And after b4 is eventually played, if a takes b4, now this rook is on an open file. I think that's the reasoning there, why he wants to keep this rook on this a file. Carlsen goes for b5 putting yet another pawn on the same color complex as his light squared bishop. But the engine doesn't think this is too bad. Carlsen needs to do something. And he's got all the space over here on the queen side, so he wants to expand with the pawns. He doesn't really have a much better plan. Now knight g3 by Anand. He wants to play g5 now and make the knight go backwards. This knight is covering the h5 square, so there will be no knight to h5. That's why he plays this move before g5. The engine actually says you can get away with e4 at this stage instead of that knight to g3 because after d takes, f takes, this line here, you can give up the pawn on g4, but white's activity is worth it. After queen to f4, you got the two central mobile pawns. This one's a passed pawn. You got better development. You have your bishop lined up on the diagonal against the rook, so if this move's played, it's going to come with an attack. So all these factors working in white's favor more than compensate for the lost pawn, according to the engine. But knight g3 was played, and now a5, queenside expansion, g5 hits the knight as planned, it goes back to e8, keeping the diagonal for the bishop open, which wouldn't be the case if it was on d7, and it wouldn't have anywhere very good to go from d7 either. All these squares are covered by pawns, so knight e8, sensible. Now e4, the f3 pawn supporting the pawn on e4, so Anand can claim a small victory by getting this move in, but he's not winning by any means. Carlsen takes out the bishop. Now that Anand is having some success with his pawn expansion, you know, he wants to take out one of the key pieces that could aid in the attack on this side of the board. Queen takes c1 by Anand, and now Carlsen plays rook to a6, which is an interesting choice. The engine was suggesting going to b8, preparing the obvious b4, but Carlsen wants to put the rook to b6. As far as I can tell, he feels there's some value in having some lateral defense in case a pawn gets to one of these squares someday. Also on b8, queen f4 would come with tempo because it would be attacking the rook. So that's what I got as far as the reasoning behind it. Rook a6, Anand pushes ahead with e5. He's got a pretty ready-made attack at this point. He's just going to go f4, f5, f6. Start opening things up around Carlsen's king. Now you got to play e5 first. If he were to try f4 first, then there'd be d takes e4, knight takes, and after knight d6, a piece is going to land on that square and stop everything up. This pawn's not going to advance any further. So e5, that just keeps a piece off of d6, which would hold up f5. Carlsen now redevelops his knight to c7. This is not the best defense. The engine says strongest would be g6 here, controlling the f5 square. It does weaken a lot of squares around the black king, but apparently black's okay, because after f4, there's going to be knight g7, just preventing f5. So stopping this pawn expansion is worth the slightly weakened king side, according to Stockfish. After knight c3, though, Anand gets in his f4, Carlsen plays b4, and Anand here plays an inaccuracy. 
He plays A takes B4. Stronger would just be F5. Just push forward, and then the rook has the option of doubling on this file. This can be very dangerous for black. But after A takes B4, now if white wants to keep both rooks on board, you know, rook to F2, then you've opened this file for this black rook. Black has some activity. So it would have been better not to take the pawn and open the file. But at this point, Anand decides to trade off a pair of rooks. Knight takes A6. And he pushes forward with F5. With one less rook on the board, nevertheless, it is still a dangerous situation for Carlson. Of course, Carlson does get in this move B3. He's got this powerful pass pawn. It's two steps away from queening. That pawn, he is hoping, will be his saving grace. Now, you might ask on the previous move, why didn't white just take out that pawn? Well, black still has a pass pawn. And now the base of white's pawn chain is a little further up the board. The structure's been weakened. So black can maybe attack that pawn with queen to b6 or something. So that wouldn't have been any better. F5 was a good move here. Now b3, queen to f4 by Anand. And there's a nasty threat here. White is threatening to play f6. If these two pawns get exchanged, now knight to h5 is very unpleasant. You don't want that knight to get to that square. Hitting f6 with check hitting h7, there's going to be a serious mating threat. So that's why you don't want to take the pawn there, because knight h5 would just happen. But g6, this will allow queen to h4. Uh-oh, what are you doing about that? So Carlson has some real issues here. But he coolly plays knight to c7. What's the difference with the knight on c7? I'll show you the difference. After this move f6, now he can play g6 because queen to h4 can be met with knight to e8, covering that square, which was necessary at this exact moment and not a move later, because after queen h6, black needs to create counter threats, because what's coming is rook to f4, rook to h4, checkmate threat. So Carlson is just in time with the b pawn, b2, and the threat of getting this queen is the only thing that is going to prevent the aforementioned checkmate. We'll see how that works. Rook to f4 by Anand, asking the question, how are you going to prevent checkmate? Carlson gets his queen. With check, this check needs to be blocked with one of these three pieces. Obviously, you don't want to do it with the rook. You need the checkmate threat. So you got the knight and the bishop. If you move the king, you're just going to get checked some more. And this is actually losing for white, according to the engine. So you need to block the check. Now, what piece would you use to block the check if you were in this position? What do you think is better, knight f1 or bishop f1? Here, Anand chose the wrong piece. He played knight to f1. And to his horror, Carlsen played queen to e1. And here, Anand had to resign because this rook is going to be taken out. If it goes to h4, there will be no checkmate. Queen takes h4. Queen takes h4. White is just a rook down, and there's no more checkmate. The g7 square is covered by the knight. This knight doesn't have a good way to get involved and create any meaningful threats. If it ever got to g4, the bishop's got that square covered. It's over. Let's briefly look at the correct move back here, which was bishop to f1. Now, incredibly, black can still draw here. See if you can find the best move for black. In this position, queen d1 is the correct defense. It's the only way to avoid a complete disaster because after rook h4, you can put the queen in the way. Mate is defended. If you take out that queen, after the pawn recaptures, this bishop can now defend from f5, since this pawn has moved. And if you try rook takes h5, bishop f5. And the engine says here that the position is roughly equal. White has a couple extra pawns. The black king is extremely weak. The mate threats are hard to eliminate. So apparently with correct play from this point, it should be a draw. But what a horrible oversight for Anand. Playing knight to f1, allowing queen to e1, with the relatively simple idea of just taking out the rook. And with this win, Carlsen is now leading 6-3. to three. With three rounds left, Anand would have to win all three games just to even the score. So while this game did not guarantee Magnus Carlsen his first world championship title, it made it all but certain, statistically speaking. And on the very next game, Carlsen got a draw, which sealed Anand's fate, making Carlsen the world chess champion for the first time in his life at age 22. 
So I hope you enjoyed this critical game number nine of Magnus Carlsen's first battle for the title in 2013. Please subscribe to this channel for more quality analysis like this coming your way soon, and thank you for watching.